Ladies and gentlemen, everyone around it in between, and this is Debate Sensei CETA edition, where we uh, address issues that are relevant to uh, competitive cross-examination debate. Uh, I have my resident expert, Devin Cooper from California State University, Long Beach, the director of debate. Thank you, Devin. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right. So this is going to be posted after the Kentucky tournament, but we're recording it before the Kentucky tournament, still after Northwestern. And uh, how did how did Long Beach do there? Uh, so we finished 6-0 in the nice. prelims, and we were the second seed, and we uh, we made it to quarters. Oh, okay. Who, t who took it all? Wake Forest. <laughs> Wake Forest. <laughs> yeah, we got ourselves a little short talking about how Wake Forest is dominating. The, all right, so we're <clears throat> early the start. final round the final round was wake forest versus texas texas okay all right um so that's that's great because now we can actually use some of what happened in the rounds that you saw to help inform us on uh first affirmatives to be aware of and so uh this episode is is really about like the the ones that are most likely to be seen and i guess that would also mean the ones that you know you saw the most of would would probably come to uh come, come into play there um but uh, you know uh, not trying to delve too deep into like weird or obscure or, or sort of niche um strategies but just the the really really straightforward ones and so i thought i'd ask it was like what do you think was the most common affirmative no first use no first use. Okay. That was the most common by far. Okay. Among the traditional teams, yes. Okay. So no first, no use, first use to China. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> specifically with China? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's not like a general no first use, not a not a not a de declaration. Um, well, not really that I saw, but most of the, the, the from the rounds that I judged and the rounds that my students were going against people, it was uh, no first use for China. Okay, no first use. All right, let's unpack it a little bit, okay? What's the basic story about no first use? What's the story that affirmatives generally tell? Um, so there's like several different ones. A lot of people just had really different advantage areas, but generally it was to improve um, relations with China, okay. um, to get some level of cooperation, which could lead to cooperation on other things like tech and green cooperation, right? <clears throat> and just like technology exchanges and things like that. Also, uh, disease impacts, saying that we could oh. use you know, some of the money like that we use to like invest in like keeping the weapons on high alert to like shift to other places. Okay. Right? And so, I mean, that was like, <clears throat> also, of course, there was like, you know, um, international modeling that if we were to like do this, it would send a signal to other people that we should disarm or like eventually lead to disarming nuclear weapons, but also that other people would embrace a no first use policy as well. Okay. So is the policy just a declaration of no first use and then it's a China advantage? Uh, no, it's no first use with China. Oh, really? <laughs> that we're not going to first strike China. Okay. So like, and well, there's uh also... There's also other apps that were like that, but rare, but most of them were like no first use with China or no first use with Russia. Oh, oh, oh Russia. You say Russia would probably come in second as far as the popularity. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Man, I'd see that almost reversed. Well, with, yeah. with Russia, a lot of people were talking about eliminating the um, – one of the trio, and usually they were talking about um, ICBMs, the land, land, oh. land arm of the trio. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I said trio. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know. They have uh, they they effectively mean the same thing. And somewhere along the line, someone just decided to use this term, and everyone accepted it. And now we got to accept it too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, the the no. What do you think is the the main weakness of the no first use policy? Um, well, one of them is just that some of it is not literally codified in law in a lot of places, oh. like in a lot of senses. It's just that like we can just stop having a no first use policy if we decide that's not advantageous for us. So it's not like always legally binding oh. in a lot of ways. Um, the other thing too is that like, you know, some like either one of those countries could perceptually grow more um, hostile, right? And could be a chance we might actually have to first strike. Okay, um, you know that's so the thing. It, yeah, so it's like it's a it's on the DA level, huh? Yeah. So we'll. Um... Yeah, but also like you know a lot of it is about deterrence on a dissent level. Deterrence, right? Just, no, we should not do that because we need to deter Russia and China. Okay. And this would be a signal of weakness. All right. So you touched upon the nuclear triad. And since we got, you know, like probably about four or five different things to go, it would be a good pace to let's talk about the, the triad. How, how popular. And so you said the triad what, was like a fairly. I, the only one that I saw was ICBMs uh, and eliminating the land base. Only the land base ones. So did you even hear about anyone doing air or sea? Not really. No, not really. Okay. 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 Because yeah, right, so we went against, well, so we went against like two critical AFs and mm. the one, I think one of the AFs we went against was uh, Wichita State's AF, which was uh, ICBMs to Russia, uh, mm. like to eliminate it, to send a signal to Russia that we're not trying to be aggressive with them. Mm -hmm. um, but ironically, I judged that round, and then they ended up debating them in doubles. Okay. So, Matt, it's crazy. All right, let's do the same sort of treatment with the triad. Like when people talk about getting rid of ICBMs, what's the story that they tell? Well, the the one story that I really saw was mostly with Russia. Okay. Um, is that they're saying that um, Russia's early warning systems are not good right mm. they're kind of saying that like their stuff is a little shaky and so any kind of mistake or some type of signal that could come up would cause um miscount and so that would make it so that they might first strike or uh, they might not first strike necessarily. well it is kind of first strike because they would make the assumption that there is a missile coming towards them and then they're going to fire back right but it's not actually firing back. It's like they're first striking. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I follow. So what they were saying is that like if we take our stuff off of um, high trigger alert with the ICBMs, uh, what it means is that Russia will already know that if something came up on their okay their radar or whatever with their high alert systems, then it means that it's not a weapon and they won't fire on us. I mean, in retaliation. Well but would they really? I mean, like... Well, that's the story that they were telling. <laughs> yeah, that's the story. Like, like, and I was thinking just... about that. I was like, I didn't see anybody really question that. And I don't even really? know if my team actually questioned that. Like, if that they were just do it anyway. But they were just making the, you know, huh. existential assessment that if there is no high alert for us, that would send a signal to Russia that even if something came up on the system, that means it's just like a blip or something that's like, you know, not serious. So they won't fire on us. It, it seems to hinge entirely on Russia believing us. Yes. Well, so <laughs> that's, that's the, you know, that was one of the stories um, that made it so that it was seen as it would be Russia's fault and not ours. Right. Because our systems are, you know, so advanced. Uh -huh. um, but other people kind of painted the picture that, um, it would be our fault because we kind of like are very isolationist, very like um, aggressive towards Russia in some ways. And so at least if we do that, that's a sign of us backing off some of that aggression. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those stories can go either way. 
Okay. How do these uh, how do these affirmatives do? We would if, if you know. Um well um I think the more traditional teams like well Harvard they got to the semis. So okay. that's pretty good. Georgetown which did the, I think Georgetown does no first use to China. Mm. They got to um, quarters. Sorry, mm -hmm. they got the semis. They got the semis. So the the tradition. So pretty much the final round was two K teams. It was Wake mm. versus Texas. So the traditional teams didn't really make it past. You're right. Um, all right. Semis. Right, semis. Yeah. But the in semis. quarters, yeah. in quarters, some other traditional teams dropped as well, like Michigan, mm -hmm. um, Dartmouth. Right. And so, like, I think we were one of the K teams that dropped. And so that was a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK. Uh, anyone doing disarm? Yes. And okay. oftentimes it was just to do disarm to get some access to a uh, to a soft impact to use against a K team. To use again. OK. Yeah, because oh, oh, like, oh. we disarm all our nuclear weapons. It's a good action. It's a negative state action. So, oh, oh right, right, right. Isn't, like we're trying to, they're try, what they're trying to do is link turn any right. imperialism or any of those type of international relations criticisms. Like we're making the United States softer, softer. We're doing stuff that's in, you know, line with the, the abolitionists. Okay. You know, so that's kind of what that was. Okay. But I mean, some people just ran disarm as well. It was just like, you know, but it was really like trying to create a international modeling to disarm, you know, everybody else. Okay. Like so that well. one, yeah. So did, did some of those disarm apps, did they, did they have like critical impacts in their, their 1AC? Um, I actually, I think Harvard's app. Oh. I think, but it was like an advantage to talk about how, um, I think it was along the lines of like nuclear weapons disproportionately hurt black people or something. Mm. I think it was an advantage area, but it was still like um, traditional sense. And I can kind of verify that really quick. Yeah, that's fine. That's uh, fine. Yes, they had a disarmament app from what I see. But they also had another app, which was no first use of China, it looks like. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. These are two different... These are two different teams running two different. Well, different no, teams. people just had different ads. So they're running them. They're they're running them different in prelims versus elim rounds. Well, so, some people are just like running them against different teams. Like, got it. Because if you have a K team, it's just like, why not just read the app that's like that's built know, for K. Uh huh. So they had, okay. um, but I think it was also the China no first use f is what they had as well um so you know people was, have different variations of what they're gonna do were they doing disarm in prelims um yes and then they switched to well they were doing i think it was a mixture of that in prelims they were okay. doing both of them because there's only three f rounds so right you know, they probably switched it up during certain rounds or whatever okay um other than than k teams were there were there any were there were there any apps that kind of straddled the three prongs or is people just basically choose one and run it choose one and run it is what i oh, think. okay um well also well some of the critical affirmatives a lot of them were playing with the term nuclear forces Oh, okay. So let's let's. Well, we let's were we were also playing with disarm, mm. and we were saying that we were utilizing a metaphor, saying that we should disarm like traditional practices and debate, just like we should disarm, you know, nuclear forces or nuclear okay. arsenal. So, it like uh, does being disarming is that play a role in? Um, uh, kind of, but like we were more so in a critical sense going for the idea that there are nuclear bombs that exist in debates that are used okay. against certain folks and that those nuclear bombs are things that should be disarmed. 
as a metaphor, okay. just like nuclear weapons should be disarmed. All right. So 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 give me the, the contours of this K. What is it called? And and what's the, the sort of through story that you tell? Well, so for us, what we were doing is that we were drawing on a metaphor of like abolition pedagogy okay. in a sense and saying that like you know, there are certain things in regular society we should disarm that are seen as nuclear bombs, but there's also things that are seen as nuclear bombs in debate and join that metaphor to both of those things. So my students, um, one of the things that they isolated as a nuclear bomb was ICE, right? Mm. Um, and they were saying like these migrant detention centers and like the process of immigration um, and the way that the United States handles that is like a nuclear bomb to let the next folks and other folks that are migrants, regardless of their um, racial background. Mm. And so that was something that we were saying. But we we're also saying that there are certain practices in debate that were like nuclear bombs as well. Um, and um, one of the things that my students were talking about were some of the microaggressions that people would use against K teams as well as them. Oh. Because um, one of the things that started to circulate was that we were CSU open borders, which was a mm -hmm. derogatory way to try to describe our arguments, because huh. you know, all of our arguments are not just about um, like migrant stuff, oh, okay. also about blackness and like other yeah. things that we use. But that was something that we saw was a weapon that is used to like delegitimize the validity of our arguments. So my students incorporated that in their one AC. Now, how do they incorporate it? Is it, these are um, uh, are these oral stories that they're reciting, or were they actually documented? In it was like it was like smaller um, smaller like quotations of okay. things that people have said. And like they were talking about like the microaggressions that exist in the hallway, the way that certain teams are treated because they don't read a plan, right? Those are things that are nuclear bombs to like K debate um, or yeah. critical teams. And also whenever you say you need to read a plan, that's like a nuclear bomb as well. Um, to say that the idealized understanding of a debater is to read plan is in a sense a nuclear bomb to K debate. Okay. Or utilizing framework. Uh, any performative performative aspects that are worked in? Yes. Yeah, so they they had like performative aspects to their um, to their their speech. They were just talking about narratives, right? But mm -hmm. they were also talking about the historic the historicity of nuclear weapons, and as well as some aspects of debate and aspects of like people winning championships. And they're automatically receiving backlash from large society as well as the debate community. Because, you know, when Wake won the NDT or just like when we won CETA, you know, we would get like what is equivalent to hate mail or posts mm. on the internet that were very much racialized. And oh, so they were saying that those are nuclear bombs as well. So, I mean, clear alternatives is like, don't do that shit. But is the abolitionist <laughs> teaching um, part of the the alt? Mm -hmm. okay. We're saying we should embrace the abolitionist mindset to disarm the harmful rhetoric, as well as weapons, as well as ICE. <clears throat> so it was like that integration. But also, it was just the iterative process to say that abolition and abolition pedagogy is something that we should embrace as a political and social project in order to improve society in some way. Okay. Okay. Um, let's keep on with the, uh, the, the critical apps. Mm -hmm. What are there other, um, were there other popular crit critical apps at this? These were all over the place. Oh, really? Okay. okay. So we had an app that was about, well, we have several apps that were about trans subjects. Okay. Um, there was, um, one app from Iowa, who's like one of my favorite teams. I judge them every tournament. Um, they read an app about the nuclear family and saying that oh damn the nuclear yeah that <clears throat> this nuclear family rhetoric came up based on the time of the age of the atom bomb and those things are co-constituent of each other and that that created the exclusion or the erasure of trans bodies or any other bodies that are gendered that are outside of the wow. concept of the nuclear <clears throat> family. 
Okay. Okay. We also like, talked about like other issues that we should embrace trans existentialism as an alternative way to view some of these concepts, and that trans um, trans existentialism is a tool that trans folks use to survive, like the nuclear bombs metaphorically in their lives that are like okay. Animals. Oh man, I I, I want to hear a little bit more about the the link level though on this, because uh, that's that's great. That's so amazing. Well, I, well, I love it when when you have that really tight connection. You know, there's like a, there's a, another element that went along with their argument is that they have this um, they have a what is known as a zine. So they have like this magazine that they give out to the judges and the opponents. Wow. And it has like a bunch of pictures and collages and cards in it. <clears throat> it's very beautiful, very innovative. And so Holy that's one moly. of the things that they use to present their argument. So it's like, if they're literally reading like a magazine, you can flip through, it has pictures, colorful. It's, it was, it's awesome. So um, I know that we're. I'm, I'm trying to focus on the one AC, but my mind is that already is the watering. AC. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But my mind is watering to the rebuttal. I don't want to get too far off topic, but how do they? How do they carry that through to the rebuttals? What happens? Well, they just talk about the that their trans existentialism is a good practice to try to resist a lot of the heteronormative and cis supremacist society that constantly is creating the conditions for a trans life to not be affirmed. Um, okay. And they say that that kind of that narrative starts at this um, nuclear family narrative that was co-constitutive with the atom bomb age, right? Wow. And that when that came about, that was the moment of possibility that made it so that um, certain things exist. But they also had like narratives of like, um, white womanhood, white trans womanhood that was okay. always seen as a way to um, normalize getting closer to cis normative understandings. And they had okay. like a particular um, person that they were discussing. I think her name was Christine Jennison, I believe, oh. that they were talking about. Um, well, now I have to look that up. Yeah. And so it was saying that she was like this normalized body that was trying to strive towards cis understandings and normative understandings of womanhood, but that was always juxtaposed to other women of color. Like I know that they cite other women in their zine, like um, this woman named Martha. Um, okay. And Martha was a person that was kind of doing the same era that they would, and they would get treated differently based on their racialization within their okay. gender. Oh, so that was one. That oh, was wow. One. That's, that's amazing. Now, do they do do they do any interesting wordplay like y'all do with the, one of the the prongs? Because you were kind of using well, nuclear disarm. forces. What's they that? Were talking, they were talking about nuclear forces. And nuclear they were forces. That, yeah, that like the nuclear family is one of those nuclear forces that came up co-constitutive to make what we know as the atom bomb age. Right. You know, yeah. 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 So that seems to that seems to link to all three fairly equal. Oh, dis nuclear forces. I see disarming nuclear forces. Okay, mm -hmm. so it is the third one. Okay, yeah, I was looking at that a little bit. I, I oversaw that one. Interesting. Okay, um, now anywhere in between. So like uh, uh, I call them like traditional critiques, I guess. But any like capitalism critiques? <laughs> okay, so yeah, there were some people that were talking about um those things right but like it was kind of like done in a very i don't want to say sneaky but literally like people would dodge the questions in cross-examination oh, okay like, for example they'll be like the the policy team would be like so are you literally going to disarm the nuclear arsenal and they'd be like well i'll ask could possibly lead to that mm. or you know why are we focusing so heavily on nuclear weapons we're talking about you know, nuclear forces in general. And those nuclear forces can be interpreted as anti-Blackness or racial capitalism or, right. you know, stuff like that, right? So there were apps that were embraced in that, like Wake's app, wow. talked about nuclear forces. And that's, were, yeah, okay. And they were, but a Wake's app was using a Langston Hughes story about this, um, the guy's simple and like, you know, building bomb shelters. And so, 
you know, this story was like one that was made a long time ago during like, you know, right after I think the nuclear bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And it was a story about how um, black people would probably not make it into bomb shelters because white people would like segregate them out. Right. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. And so it was like this idea that if black people could survive Mississippi or, you know, the segregated South, they can survive anything, especially right. a nuclear bomb. OK. And so, yeah. And that was a Langston Hughes um, publication? Short story, yes. Oh, short story. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, OK, so uh, I, I remember debating and you always had to be prepared for the, the Marxist capitalist critique. Well, so there, there. So, what was more prevalent? Because um, there's been debaters, past debaters, and former coaches that have written articles about um, psychoanalysis in nuclear oh, okay. bombs, right? Um, um, one particular scholar that used to be a, a judge for me and my debate partner, Callum Matheson, mm. um, he wrote a book about desiring the bomb, and so oh. people were using Callum Matheson eighteen cards to talk about the psychoanalytic approach to that, but also people were using um, Ben Meech's article about the racialization and psychoanalysis of the bomb. And so people were making apps about that, you know, and so that was that was another strand of literature that people were using psychoanalysis and talking about nuclear bombs. Um, All right. Wow. OK, psychoanalysis, but not n none of the none of the, the old school cap K stuff, anything like well, that. Not that I've seen. There yeah. could be some ass that did, but a lot of people were doing stuff with coloniality and settler colonialism. Yeah, okay. Right. A lot of that was going on. Um, a lot of like quite a few ass were about anti blackness. Okay. Right? Um, and different veins and different strands of that flavor. Um I didn't really see a lot of feminism ones yet. Okay. But I know that our J V team was reading um some of those type of arguments, but we're still developing a lot of those for them to get ready to roll it out even more. Because um, what they were going to do is read um, some narratives, or uh, more so um, Latinx or Latina speculative fiction. Yeah. So, and they were going to talk about like a, a protagonist named Elena and how she was living in this dystopian world that started to embrace nuclear weapons and they kind of instituted like forced labor to build oh. a lot of the nuclear stuff and then a nuclear bomb accidentally triggers. And you know, that's a thing, but like, we're still working on that, but, um, but we'll see, it should be done by the time this video is out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I haven't seen a lot of the feminist based arguments. I've seen a lot of um, psychoanalytic, anti-black racial cat. Um, also, uh, Texas did an F that was mostly primarily one author, and they were talking about um, discourse, and they were talking about civilizational discourse as a nuclear weapon or nuclear force. Civilizational needs, uh, discourse. Yeah. So it's pretty much the backdrop of how civil society has been created based on a bunch of different um, intersections of uh, bad forms of discourse that have been made, especially like colonial rhetorics. Right. right? And so that was, that was their F. And so we were, we went negative against that F and, you know, we read some arguments. We definitely read, um, Afro pessimism against them. Okay. Um, we had like, a uh, a, a argument that was about Latina, Latinx History Month or Heritage mm. Month, right? And we we did some some funny things with that. But <laughs> I think in the end, we went for a theoretical argument about perms being bad. Perms being bad, and that's what, yes. what made it in rebuttals. OK. Yes. Perms and bad. Won. OK. Um, it was a techie trick that was done, but we knew the judge that we had likes technical Oh, cheap shots like that. So we went oh, really? Them. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so we actually we technically went for the Latino um, History Month argument, Latinx History Month, mm -hmm. and we also went for the Param theory for like 
two and a half minutes to three minutes. Mm. And that was what won the debate. There you go. All right. <laughs> last last thing. If, if you were to break down sort of traditional policy apps versus uh, critical apps, what, what do you think that breakdown was at this tournament? Oh, there was definitely more traditional apps. Than oh, yeah. But how, like, what do you think the spread is? Uh, there was 122 teams. I would okay. say at least 50 were traditional. Okay. Okay. At least fifty to fifty-five, because it was more, it was more policy teams than there were K teams. Okay. Right, and so by the end, as you're looking at the bracket, like the K teams were dropping, 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 and then mm -hmm. like the traditional teams just dropped at semis, and then the K teams, the two, you know, um, Texas and Wake, they were the final, like you know, all right, final round. Okay. Um, but I would say there was definitely a lot more traditional teams because a lot of okay. um, traditional teams brought multiple teams like Kansas. I think they bought like maybe six or seven teams. Emory uh -huh. brought like six or seven teams. Right. It was Michigan bought like five or six teams. And most of Michigan's teams are straight up traditional. I think there was only one that might have been doing something different, maybe one or two, but okay. I can't verify that. Only one of them I know, because one of our um, folks judged them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, Devin, thank you so much. Uh, uh, the next episode we're going to tackle is going to be one NCs that you should be aware of. And so just the variety of options there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here and giving us your insight. You're welcome. All right. <laughs>